So, Dr. Bob Slaughter is in charge tonight, and we'll introduce our guest. Welcome to the 31st Annual Winter Lecture Series. <clears throat> this uh, series, as you already know, is dealing with national borders and refugees, social and political consequences. In addition to Chuck and myself, there are eight other people on the steering committee. This is a community group, not necessarily from any church, any denomination, and so forth. The Winter Lecture Series is sponsored by the Nebraska Cultural Endowment and OLLI and the Social Action Committee of the Church. In addition, we're always most grateful for help from the Humanities Nebraska. And you can see this uh, the logo here. And uh, we are asked to read the following statement uh, about their purpose and function. This program is brought to you by Humanities Nebraska, a statewide nonprofit organization cultivating an understanding of our history and our culture. With additional funding, from the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. If you enjoy this type of programming, please consider supporting Humanities Nebraska with a contribution. Donations are matched by state and federal funds. Your support helps preserve our past and inform our history. Uh, we have asked you to sign in because Nebraska Humanities likes to know who actually attends uh, programs that they support. <clears throat> if you missed last week's very fine introductory uh, lecture, uh, it will soon be on the Unitarian uh, website. I checked this morning and it is not on quite yet, but I'm sure it will be very soon. And that website is www.unitarianlincoln, all one word, dot o-r-g. And this is the same uh, website that you can check in case Sometime you have doubts about whether we're actually going to meet because of the weather. We always hope that Sundays will be good, but once in a while there might be a question about that. Um, the format is an hour of lecture, approximately. Uh, 10 to 15 minutes break for goodies, and then a question and answer until nine o'clock. We try to end promptly at nine o'clock. These lectures are entirely free to the public. Likewise, refreshments are donated. But if you leave a small contribution for the refreshments, your contribution this year will support future winter lecture series. So you're investing in the continuing uh, program that we've had for so many years. Hearing assistance, uh, Chuck has already mentioned that. So, as Chuck said, my next responsibility is to introduce the speaker. But he needs no introduction here. I'm sure that almost all of you know him very well because of his very insightful talks that he has given in this community. But it's not just we here in Lincoln that have this privilege, but he also is known throughout 
United States for his professional work. And furthermore, he is also known very well throughout the world internationally for his expertise on human rights. Now I'm going to shut up and leave the time for David. to start these lectures with uh, thanks to the organizing committee, but I'm on the organizing committee, so I think <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll skip that one. Uh, if anything I say uh, piques your interest about the United Nations and refugees, there is a table in the lobby uh, sponsored by the local United Nations Association, United Nations Association, Nebraska. Website is uh, unanebraska.org. UNANebraska.org, there's some information out there. Uh, since we were plugging different organizations, I thought I'd work that plugging. Okay, well, um, as advertised, uh, I'll be addressing uh, forced migration, which right away uh, turns out to be more complicated than you would think. There are, if you will, political refugees who are persons with a well-founded fear of persecution, a well-founded fear of persecution who crossed an international border. Um, the, these are traditional refugees. There is a refugee treaty from 1951, and so these types of persons are also called conventional refugees, meaning related to the treaty. A convention is a multilateral treaty. So you have political refugees, who presumably have been targeted for persecution by public authorities. But then you have people who are not necessarily uh, targeted for persecution. They are not fleeing persecution as such. They are fleeing violence, instability, war. And international law tells us there are two kinds of war, <laughs> international war and internal war, also known as civil war. So you, you have people fleeing unrest, violence, instability, war. Uh, they are also called refugees. Uh, then, if you will, there are internal refugees, people who are uprooted, people who are displaced, but have not crossed an international border. And in the jargon of international relations, these are IDPs, internally displaced persons. Uh, so legally speaking, uh, refugees are different from IDPs, but in fact, you're talking about people who are uprooted from their traditional place of uh, residence, and they don't have a, a normal, typical relationship with their home government. That's the key. Uh, returnees, okay, some people flee, and then they come back, and then the refugee agency supervise them and work with them, make sure they're not uh, targeted again. I will not uh, be talking about what might be called environmental refugees, there are organizations uh, that work with people fleeing drought, fleeing um, earthquakes, famines, fires, whatever. You can call these <laughs> environmental refugees if you want. Uh, there's a UN office, the Office of the Coordinator of Humanitarian Assistance. There's part of the Red Cross Network, International Federation of Red Cross, Red Crescent Societies. I'm not going to be talking about them. I'm talking about force migration from, well, the old terminology was man-made events. Uh, that's not gender sympathetic, uh, but anyway, um, talking about forced migration because of human causes. Uh, political refugees, war refugees, internal refugees. All of those. I'm going to be talking about three organizations and three networks. The world began to get itself organized to deal with refugees after World War I. Before that, nothing much. After World War I, during the League of Nations, uh, the first office that was created under the League of Nations was to deal specifically with Russian refugees. The old czarist 
Russian Empire had collapsed, Soviet Union declared, civil war between the Reds and the Whites, lots of Russians fleeing in the rest of Europe, and international relations being European dominated uh, took notice. You then got uh, the Danson office under the League of Nations, but the point is not to give you a long history of the evolution of efforts to deal with or refugees in an organized way, but to point out that the main UN refugee agency is the logical outcome of what started uh, back in the early days of the League of Nations. So after World War II, starting in World War I, League of Nations, after World War II, you get the UNHCR, the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, or as they say in their logo, the UN Refugee Agency. Uh, created in 1950, tied to the main refugee treaty in 1951. The agency was actually created before the treaty was negotiated and came into effect. But that's not the only refugee agency in the UN. I was asked tonight to talk a lot about the Middle East, which I'm glad to do. There's always something going on in the Middle East. So you have in the UN a second refugee agency, not the UNHCR, but UNRWA, whose title is a mile long. Uh, the United Nations Agency for Relief and Works, the Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees in the Near and Middle East. It's a small agency with a big title. Uh, created in 1949 and dealing only with Palestinian refugees and still caught in the middle of that problem today. So UNHCR from 1950, UNRWA from 1949, and the frame for these agencies is some kind of refugee work. But there's another frame, there's another prism, there's another legal approach which overlaps with the refugee approach and that's where uh, what is loosely called the International Red Cross comes into play. There's no such organization as the International Red Cross. There's a network made up of different Red Cross and Red Crescent agencies. And the start of the Red Cross was to focus on victims of war. Well, refugees fleeing war are victims of war. Internally displaced persons because of war are victims of war. So you have the refugee treaty and the refugee framework, but you have the laws of war and the war framework, and they overlap, but the start of the Red Cross was to focus on victims of war. Uh, it was not started by uh, an American, Clara Barton, it was not. It was not started by a Brit, Florence Nightingale, it was not. It was started by a Swiss, Henry Dunant, winner of the first Nobel Peace Prize, and it all started in the period 1859-1863. So that frame, that set of laws, that concern focusing on victims of war uh, goes back uh, even further back than concern with refugees. So the people I'm going to talk about, the persons I'm going to talk about, and the laws that come into play, unfortunately, are complicated and overlapping but I think we can sort this out in a reasonable way. From the point of view of, uh, uh, actually that should say UNHCR, that's a typo right there. From the point of view of UNHCR with its global responsibilities, one way of getting around all the various technicalities is simply to talk about persons of concern political refugees, war refugees, IDPs, persons of concern. And it used to be the case, the blue is refugees, and whatever color that is, is IDPs. And it used to be that there were more refugees than IDPs. And now there are more IDPs. And actually, um, given the events of the last uh, three years, this this information is based up to 2012, as you can see. If you took it today, you'd have 30 to 40 million people being persons of concern by the UNHCR. I'm sorry about the typo. 
I can't tell you how many times I went through these slides and right away I just, it's hard to edit your own work. Uh, and the main reason for the changing categories is that we now don't have so many international wars, but we have lots of civil wars. Uh, we haven't had an international great power war, thankfully, since 1945. But we have civil wars, we have internal wars, the lawyers call it uh, non-international armed conflict, uh, internal wars. And you get a lot of people, as in Syria, who are displaced and uprooted, but are still within the same country. And they are very hard to get to. They are very hard to access. If you want to provide food, clothing, shelter, health care, very hard to operate inside countries in places like Syria. Uh, so we have uh, about 30 to 40 million people displaced, uprooted, either refugees of some sort or IDPs. Uh, the French you can handle. By the time you leave tonight, you'll be fluent in French. <laughs> And again, up to 2012, uh, as of today, at the top would be Syria, Syria and Afghanistan. This is only refugees now, not IDPs, uh, because Syria now has produced 3 million refugees. 3 million refugees. The countries producing the most refugees are Afghanistan and Syria. About a third of Afghanistan has fled the country. About 40% of Syria has fled the country. Um, actually, 40% if you add in the IDPs. But anyway, large portions of those uh, uh, countries have fled abroad. You can read Iraq, Sudan, Somalia. I'll come back to some of these countries. <coughs> in this hemisphere, you have Colombia, which has a long-running long civil war between the government and the FARC. Uh, so Colombia is a long-standing problem. Uh, actually, in numbers today, Vietnam and Eritrea have dropped down a little bit. Uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, a uh, very bad situation. So this information is easily available about which countries produce the most refugees. Now, uh, David Iaquinta last week had a very good point in talking about the American debate over immigration, and his point was the, the, the debate doesn't always fit with the facts. Uh, because of ideology, because of whatever, people make various arguments and, and the facts are otherwise. Uh, the West believes it is being flooded with refugees. The refugees are over there, somewhere, as in Jordan and Lebanon, tremendously impacted by the Syrian refugee problem. If you look at the number of refugees being hosted relative to the population of the country, it is not the West that is bearing refugee burdens. It is the poorer countries of the global south. So you have Jordan and Lebanon, Lebanon very small of course, greatly impacted by Syrian refugees. Chad, very small, very poor, right next to Darfur. Right next to Darfur in western Sudan. Congo both produces refugees and hosts refugees. I'll come back to that. That's not unusual, actually. It, it sounds bizarre that the same country has people fleeing and other people at the same time coming in. It happens all the time. Uh, and you could go on down. Montenegro is the only European country on the list, and that's because it's next to Kosovo. It's next to Bosnia. So it gets a lot of refugees from uh, the Western Balkans. But most refugees are dealt with in the lesser developed countries of the global south, not in the rich west. Particularly if you relate it to the population figures. Countries with the most displacement. Syria, that figure is now 7 million. Syria. Nigeria, Boko Haram, 
greatly disrupted uh, northeast Nigeria, Congo, Sudan, Darfur, and now also in the south. Sudan has two major refugee problems, the western part of Darfur and in the south, uh, coming from now South Sudan, the newest member of the UN, South Sudan, is unfortunately uh, terribly disrupted. Iraq and Somalia, so, okay, basic patterns. Now, we go, and this is the correct <laughs> acronym, UNHCR, the Refugee Agency, Global Responsibilities. It has practically no guaranteed budget. The final budget each year now is about $5 billion to take care of 40 million people. More or less rounded off. 2% of that is guaranteed through the regular UN budget. The rest voluntary contributions from whomever. Well, the most important whomever are the Western states. And who pays the piper calls the tune. So the United States is by far the largest contributor, not per capita, but total amount of money. European Union, you can read the list. And it's only recently that non-Western states like Kuwait and Saudi Arabia have entered the top ten. Top ten used to be always all Western. Now it's mostly all Western. And also the head of UNHCR is always a Westerner. That's not by accident. So the head, the High Commissioner for Refugees now, is Guterres, Guterres, and he gets to hobnob with Angelina Jolie and other Hollywood celebrities. Uh, he's a former Prime Minister of Portugal, and the number one guy at the UNHCR is always from the West, and the number two guy is always an American because they control the budget. And if you control the budget, you control a lot of the policy. Um, actually, UNHCR started in 1950 and then was tied to the main refugee treaty in 1951 as a Western project to embarrass European communists. The Westerners control. We still control. We control through the purse strings. We control through the leadership. Um, the, the global refugee project is basically a Western project with a few other countries like pro-West Kuwait, pro-West uh, Saudi Arabia. If you think back to what I first said about political refugees uh, fleeing a situation of persecution, that language was designed to embarrass the Soviet Union. To talk about, we're going to take care of those people uh, fleeing persecution, well, in the 1950s, most of those people were trying to get out of communist Europe. The numbers were very small, because there was one thing the communists were very good at, closing their borders. Iron Curtain. They could keep dissidents in. So, initially, you're talking about UNHCR, small numbers of people able to get out of their home country and claim a well-founded fear of persecution. So it was a Western project and it was uh, oriented toward embarrassing European communism. The Soviets, their allies, never joined, never paid any money. There's a reason for that. Uh, that was the start of the whole thing. So you have uh, basically funding by the West and leadership by the West, although things have changed as I will show since 1950. One of the best uh, High Commissioners for Human Rights was a political scientist. I want to get that in. Was a political scientist. <laughs> Sadako got a political scientist from Japan. Her husband was a diplomat. She wound up being a diplomat. She's very good. I recommend her Myanmar. Uh, she was head of UNHCR in the 1990s. She's written a very good book called Turbulent Decade. Turbulent Decade. And she said what everybody knows. 
International response to humanitarian crisis situations, including refugees, is largely determined by the degree of strategic interest held by the major states. I'll tell you a story that shows how this works. You remember Rwanda, 1994, genocide. The end of that, as the militant Hutus were losing control, you had a Hutu flight out of Rwanda. So you had Rwandans going into Zaire, two million overnight, big numbers. And you had a lot of the genocidaires, you had a lot of the people who had uh, committed genocide in Rwanda. They fled too, and they were in the refugee camps and they were still armed. Not supposed to be any weapons in refugee camps run by UNHCR. Uh, Ogana goes to the UN Security Council. She says, I've got this problem with the refugee camps. Security Council, you need to authorize force to clean out the camps, get rid of these militia. The U.S. had just been through Somalia, Mogadishu, Black Hawk Dam, 18 Americans killed. The last thing the Americans wanted to do was another operation in Africa, dealing with nasty guys. Uh, other Western European states uh, didn't want to get involved in cleaning out these refugee camps, and the Security Council did not authorize use of force to clean out the camps. Western states control what happens, and then what Ogata does, because she is technically independent, <laughs> Guterres is technically independent, Ogata goes to Zaire, not the most reliable state in Africa then, or now as Democratic Congo, and she manages to put together some small military units to go in and clean out the camps because the UN Security Council won't do it because the Western states don't want to take on more nasty operations because they've just seen nasty operations in Somalia. Uh, um, yes, there are some people claiming to be refugees and then seeking asylum. Refugees, asylum seekers, lawyers like to argue over these semantics. Uh, you can see in Europe, in that part of the West, uh, where you have the most asylum seekers, you can read the list as well as I. Um, refugees go to particular countries because some have better benefits for refugees. Some have relatives already in that country. Some are geographically easier to get to from where the asylum seeker starts. So uh, you can see some basic information. Then again, you can look at which European states accept the most refugees relative to the size of their own population. Sweden is very generous. Can you read the countries in the back or is it too blurry? From left to right, uh, accepting the most relative to their population, Sweden, Austria, Netherlands, Belgium, the average, France, Finland, Denmark, Luxembourg, UK, Germany, Ireland. We can come back to these in the Q&A if you want to raise questions. It is a fact, psychologically, that everywhere in the West there is a feeling that there are too many refugees, too many asylum seekers, and this has always been the case. Is it also too blurry to read in the back? Print's too small. So the black line on the left, percentage of a population, percentage of a nation saying there are too many immigrants, immigrants, all types, Economic immigrants, refugees, too many foreigners of all types, black line, Britain leads the Britain leads the list. Britain, France, Italy, United States have this view that there are just too many foreigners uh, either in the country or trying to get in the country. And then the blue line on the left 
Immigration is a problem, not an opportunity. Again, a kind of general negative view toward immigration going in, foreigners. The chart on the right is very interesting because it shows that regardless of the number of people entering the country or wanting to enter the country, there is a certain amount of people who always say there are too many foreigners trying to get in. Even in the distant past when there were more people leaving than coming in. That black line on the right is a kind, it's a wonder it, because it's a wonder it's not higher than it is because now you have factually lots of asylum seekers in the West but not relative to the South. Lots of asylum seekers in the West relative to the past of the West. And the, the, number, the percentage of people in each country, each Western country saying we've got too many people coming in uh, has been constant more or less and is even down a little bit. So there is this feeling in the West that we have too many asylum seekers, too many refugees, and also too many economic immigrants. It's a different category. Uh, even though uh, the global big picture is that 80% of refugees are dealt with outside the West, and only 20% of the big picture in the West. And yet, feeling in the West, U.S., Canada, everybody, uh, too many of these folks knocking on our door. I want to go back to UNHCR. I'm not going to give you a pop quiz on all this specific information. Uh, to put together uh, a budget, UNHCR has to rely not only on Western states, but on other international organizations. World Bank, for example, has to put together a budget uh, from other UN agencies. I will, the picture there is of the World Food Program. The World Food Program not only contributed um, nine, ten million dollars to the refugee office, but you see the picture, the World Food Program also puts people on the ground. They don't just sit in offices in Geneva, <laughs> sit in offices in New York. They actually have people on the ground, and it's unfortunate these days that they're usually wearing helmets and Black jackets. Can't see the picture very well. And in fact, the UN Refugee Agency relies very heavily on non governmental organizations. I chose arbitrarily Oxfam in Lebanon. The fact is, you can talk all you want about uh, food, clothing, shelter, or health care, but if you don't have clean water, if you don't keep it clean with proper sanitation, you're not going to save the people. You start with clean water. That's what Oxfam has been doing in Lebanon. But I could talk about Doctors Without Borders. I could talk about Caritas. I could talk about Save the Children. I could talk about any of the so-called development NGOs that are also on the ground doing the nitty-gritty work uh, on refugees. In fact, uh, globally, Starting back from the League of Nations with Russian refugees working up to now, there is an international refugee regime. What do I mean by that? You had a, a set of rules and agencies to manage a big problem. You have a whole series of rules, which I'm not going to go into. Some are legal, some are diplomatic. Uh, you bypass a lot of the discussion about who's fleeing persecution and who's fleeing violence by talking about persons of concern. Basic rule is no forced repatriation, respect for human rights, etc. And you have states, international organizations, private organizations, and in a way you have governance without government. If you haven't noticed, there's no world government. Uh, despite what some fanatics uh, will tell you, the UN is not a world government. But you can have governance without government. You can have management of a problem. It's a very complicated thing, but there is a refugee regime. Uh, let's talk about the Middle East. I'll start with Syria. I'll jump ahead and jump back. Geography lesson. Syria, where the refugees go, the IDPs are stuck. And of course, some of these, <laughs> well, 
Some flee Syria and go to Iraq, and at the same time, some people are fleeing Iraq and go to Syria. Let's go back. Syria uh, has generated 3 million refugees. Uh, the IDP chart disappeared. It's wrapped around under Syria. Okay. Thank you. Um, Last time I looked, Gremlins got a hold of my slides. Last time I looked, it's fine. Okay, so you have three million uh, people fleeing Syria. I'll talk more about them later. Uh, you have seven million trapped, ten million people. What's the population of Syria? Twenty-two million. Twenty-two million. Ten displaced, uprooted. Talking civilians now. We're not talking. Fighters. We're not talking about militias. We're not talking about ISIS. We're talking about civilians. So Syria is a huge problem. Um, Lebanon. Lebanon hasn't generated so many refugees outward. You got 1.1 million refugees in Lebanon, mainly Syrians and Palestinians. Syrians and Palestinians. What's the population of Lebanon? 4.5 million. 4.5 million. And they're hosting over a million refugees. Would any Western country do that? Forget it. Forget it. Jordan. We'll talk about uh, one camp in particular in Jordan. Uh, again, not generating so many refugees outward. Uh, but hosting large numbers of refugees. Yemen's been in the news, falling apart, failed state. We have uh, the Shia in the north, more or less taking over the government, but this is not making the Sunnis in the south very happy. Yemen, by the way, used to be two separate countries. It's, it's never worked well put together. So the big problem is both as bad as Yemen is, it is hosting Almost 250,000 refugees. Where are they coming from in Yemen? Where are they coming from? Somalia. Coming across the border from Somalia. Uh, I've got a chart on that later. Um, and so on. And Iraq, the big problem in Iraq is now uh, internally displaced. Almost 2 million Iraqis still uprooted uh, by us. Uh, by various factions in Iraq, by ISIS now, uh, which controls parts of uh, northern Syria and uh, uh, also northwestern uh, Iraq. So lots of IDPs in Iraq, big problems. And so we've already seen this slide briefly. There needs to be another red line from Syria going past Cyprus over to Greece, Italy, Spain. I'll come back to that. That's a big problem. We can come back to these. One refugee camp in Jordan. As of last week, 83,000 people. It's a Atari refugee camp. That's bigger than Grand Island. Grand Island is 50,000. 51,000, 52,000. How would you like to be in charge of this refugee camp for UNHCR? Uh, the host state is uh, responsible for macro security. Jordan is responsible for macro security. The UNHCR is officially responsible for everything else. But it partners with the World Food Program. It partners with Oxfam. It partners water, food, clothing, shelter, uh, protection of women and girls, local policing. That's all up to the UNHCR in partnership fundamentally with Jordan. And you have these camps in various places. Uh, winter's very bad this year in the Middle East, especially in Lebanon, which is quite mountainous. So you have temporary housing, no <coughs> indoor toilets, no indoor showers, um, no basic heating, maybe kerosene, uh, kerosene burners or whatever. So. You have the reality. Uh, if you go back, if you go back to Syria, 
uh, in the north, if you're trapped in the north, if you can get out into the north, you're going to go to Turkey. And, oops, that's an expression. Um, been a lot of fighting over Kobani between ISIS and mainly the Iraqi Kurds, but other Kurds, the Kurdish uh, Peshmerga, have recently, as of last week, driven ISIS out of Kobani. Kobani uh, was a Syrian town or city of some 40,000 people, which swelled to 400,000 because of uh, IDPs, and is now basically rubble. You can see the top left, Kobani is basically rubble. People flee as they always do, mainly women and children and old men like me. And then they flee into Turkey, and the local camp may be operated by the Red Crescent, Turkish Red Crescent, or uh, International Red Cross Red Crescent, or the camp may be operated by the UN. And the Turkish camps are pretty good as they go, but still, um, you might have housing in tents, you might have housing in the type of units that were used in this country after Katrina. You had a lot of people put up in these uh, uh, portable housing units after Katrina. They're used around the world. They're a little bit more expensive than the tents. Still talking about Syria. Big problem. Big problem. Human trafficking people, criminal gangs taking advantage of refugee situation. Top right is a ghost ship. It's a ghost ship. Criminal enterprises will buy an old ship right before it's converted to scrap metal, costs not much. Then they'll sell places in it to refugees. They will basically program the ship for Italy. They will lock the captain's deck, they will lock the engine room, and they will abandon the ship. No crew. Go ship. Full of refugees. And then it's up to the Italian Coast Guard, European Naval Forces to put a crew on board, intercept the ship, process the people, put them in refugee camps in southern Italy, Spain, Greece, Malta. They don't go to Cyprus so much, I don't know why. They do go to Malta. Um, this year from Syria, 230,000 refugees tried to reach southern Europe by ship. This does not make the Italians happy. You remember when we had lots of people coming from Haiti, you remember when we had lots of boat people coming from Cuba, even though they were fleeing communism in Cuba, lots of Americans didn't like all the boat people. Well, you have lots of boat people from Syria. Also from Libya, the same sort of black market enterprise uh, goes on from Libya, short trip. Actually, if you go on the internet tonight, you can see that the Italians have intercepted um, a whole series of boats transporting Libyans. Of course, we have this uh, in Central America. We call them coyotes. Uh, you have people who will take money and promise Hondurans and Guatemalans and maybe some Mexicans to deliver them to Texas, Arizona, or whatever. And frequently the coyotes will abandon the um, refugees, uh, asylum seekers. Well, the same thing goes on. Uh, big time, big time in the Mediterranean from Syria, Libya. Quickly switching to from UNHCR to UNRWA, in a way the story is the same. Uh, it's a kind of a Western enterprise. Uh, UNRWA was created uh, in 1949 after the creation of the State of Israel. You had, as you know, a uh, military struggle over British. Western Palestine. I don't have time to go into all of this history, but basically you have a civil war for British Western Palestine between the Zionist movement and various Arab parties. Um, you had, from the fighting in 47, 48, 49, about 700,000, 750,000 uh, Palestinian refugees, which now number 5 million. 
natural increase. So, UNRWA was created. I think the West felt guilty a bit for what had happened. In any way, you had some real humanitarian problems there. Uh, you have a budget of $2 billion. The Director General is Swiss, Pierre Cranbull. I know him reasonably well. He used to be at the International Committee of the Red Cross. I don't know why he moved to UNRWA. My guess is it's similar to what Warren Buffett said when he was asked why he bought a certain airline. He said, temporary insanity. Uh, uh, because UNRWA is nothing but one gigantic headache. You've got ref Palestinian refugees in Gaza, West Bank, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, elsewhere. But if UNRWA can't really do anything. It's, it's, it's an international department of health and human services. It's, it's a kind of international social agency but it's not charged with mediating a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So in the recent fighting in Gaza, you had uh, lots of Gazans going into UNRWA facilities because they're supposed to be neutral. And then they were hit by Israeli fire. So now you have three investigations. You probably can't read this in the back row. Uh, this is what uh, Pierre Cranbull uh, said. UNRWA was affected by seven incidents of munitions fired at its schools, three of them with deadly consequences, 42 deaths, 200 persons with multiple injuries. <laughs> we condemn these attacks by Israel. He named Israel by name. At the same time, they discovered that unnamed Palestinian groups had stored uh, munitions in three of the schools. So you have both sides not respecting the neutrality, and you have, in this case, IDPs, or maybe some of these people were original refugees, but mainly IDPs who were um, killed or wounded even though they had sought safety, safety in UNRWA facilities. Also, in southern Lebanon, you have Palestinian refugee camps. Uh, UNRWA is active not only in Gaza and the West Bank, but also in southern uh, Syria, also in Lebanon. And uh, actually, UNRWA staff took casualties took casualties in southern Syria because of fighting in that area. And again, you see that uh, humanitarian aid workers are in flak jackets and helmets. Uh, it's a risky prof profession. Uh, very quickly, I want to talk about uh, not just the two UN refugee agencies I've talked about, but I want to talk about the International Committee of the Red Cross, which was the original Red Cross agency. 1859-1863. It started out dealing with war wounded. You may know it as the uh, group, International Committee of the Red Cross, that visits prisoners of war. Uh, it was the group that was always at Guantanamo. Always at Guantanamo. Documenting what went on there. Never in those CIA black sites, but was in Guantanamo. But one of its big concerns is civilian war victims. Civilian war victims overlaps with refugees and IDPs. Entirely independent of the UN, but may decide to work with the UN or not. If you look it up on Syria, ICRC very active in Syria, working with the Syrian Arab Red Crescent, which is not under the thumb of Assad. The Syrian Arab Red Crescent is more independent than the American Red Cross. <laughs> That's one way to put it. And so, um, interesting things are going on on the ground. You've got a humanitarian tragedy in Syria. But actually what's happened in the last few weeks is that um, the Red Cross Red Crescent Network has been able to negotiate about five or six local truces for bringing in humanitarian assistance to civilians. And there is some hope that these local truces can be expanded into a more general ceasefire. I would not bet the farm on that. This is still the Middle East. Um, but actually, despite all the violence and all the refugees and all the IDPs and ISIS and the Nusra Front 
and all the terrible things going on, there are pockets of uh, humanitarian progress, um, including some promising developments by the Red Cross Red Crescent Network. Uh, the Syrian Ed, uh, Arab Red Crescent has had numerous staff persons killed, um, trying to bring in humanitarian assistance. Uh, ICRC has not had any of their staff killed yet, but they've had three taken hostage. Um, as far as anybody knows, still alive. Uh, so it's a very delicate operation, as we'll see. In fact, anywhere there's violence in the world, anywhere you have civilians that are threatened because of violence, you will find at least the ICRC present, except in Darfur where it was kicked out because it was pushing the government side too much. Billion dollars budget plus donors from the West. ICRC is a very good operation. Some of the national Red Cross Red Crescent, uh, you can forget about those, but some of them are good as well, as in Syria. It's a tricky business to, to get your neutral emblems recognized, mainly Red Crescent, Red Cross. To get militias to respect the neutral emblems, these private armed groups, they're not operating out there with their lawyers. They haven't read the Geneva Conventions. So you're trying to do what you can in obey. And lots of people in that part of the world don't like the cross. They don't like the cross. In fact, I tell you, when the ICRC does prison visits at Guantanamo, they take off the cross. They wear a thing on their shirt pocket. They take it off when they're interviewing Muslim detainees. The cross is not a big favorite in much of the Middle East. It may be neutral, but uh, uh, the Israeli equivalent of the American Red Cross is uh, MDA, Magin David Adon. So there you have the president of the ICRC on the left, Peter Marr, who's a former Swiss diplomat, meeting in um, Israel at Magin David Adon with Israeli officials on humanitarian questions. At the same time, the ICRC is working with the Palestinian Red Crescent, which maybe shouldn't exist, but it does. Um, and in the picture of the right, you probably can't see it. Some people are wearing the Red Crescent, some people are wearing the Red Cross, and they're the two neutral emblems. And of course, you're hoping it works. Uh, in Gaza, you still have lots of displaced persons from the fighting. These are ICRC figures, which are usually quite reliable. Actually, you have probably now, I don't have a date on this, July, September, I don't know, it's probably 2013 or 2014 now, in Gaza you have about 100,000 people displaced. Uh, and uh, there have been pledges from the West to put in money for uh, housing, but it's not working, it's not moving. Uh, you, you've still got big problems in Gaza with regard to uh, displaced persons and lack of housing. And according to the ICRC figures of those um, killed and wounded, over a quarter were women and children. Perfect timing. Uh, I actually got some other slides we can come back to. If you want to talk about Africa, if you want to talk about Somalia, if you want to talk about South Sudan, those are big, huge problems. I was asked to focus on the Middle East. Just to review some basic points. Uh, forced migration of various types, refugees and IDPs, 30 to 40 million persons in the world. Uh, big effort at taking care of these people now compared with the League of Nations era. I mean, it's, it's all very depressing, but if you take a historical view, it's better than it was in terms of trying to do something for these 30 to 40 million people. But UNHCR and UNRWA and International Committee of the Red Cross are all boxed in. They focus on humanitarian need. They focus on humanitarian help. The solution 
to the problem of Syrian refugees and IDPs is to stop the fighting and have some agreement in Syria. The solution to the Palestinian refugee problem is some negotiated solution on a whole series of issues, <coughs> one of which is the refugee question. You have borders, you have status of Jerusalem, you have security zones, but you also have these five million Palestinian refugees uh, and, and what's going to happen with them? Well, if this happens, it's going to happen because of negotiations among governments with some mediation from the UN Secretary General or his representatives. Uh, it's not the mandate of UNHCR. It's not the mandate of UNRWA. It's not the mandate of the Red Cross Red Crescent Network to come up with these fundamental problems. Either basically you repatriate refugees because the situation back home has changed or you resettle them somewhere else. And that's up to the public authorities, that's up mainly to governments. The humanitarian agencies are left dealing with the humanitarian issues, but the solutions to these uh, refugee problems and IDP problems the, the solutions are political. They have to do with governmental decisions about borders and security and who's going to govern and those kinds of questions. And I look forward to your questions after the break. <laughs>